There are some shows that are quickly forgotten. Hundreds of anime come out every year, and really only a few are remembered for years to come. Kill a Kill came out at the end of 2013, and of course Discord is distracting me, whatever. Kill a Kill came out at the end of 2013, and five years later, it is still one of the more talked about shows, especially from that time. Despite the fact that I saw it over four years ago, I don't think I could ever forget the experience it took me on. When it first came out, there's some controversy because of its fan service, and a lot of people saw it as an inferior Gurren Lagann. But it is a show that, as I think more about it, it keeps standing out more and more, becoming one of my favorite anime of all time. It perfectly nails how absurd shows can work by succeeding in three important ways. First, it's an incredibly fun show, and I can't help but just enjoy myself as I see everything unfold. The characters are all bombastic. The whole premise is insane, and every episode seems to top the previous with the craziness, and it doesn't feel like it ever reuses the same jokes too often. This alone would make me like it and recommend it, and maybe even put it on my top anime of all time list when I ever make that again. But while some shows like Keijo or Konosuba would stop here, very content with what they did, Kill a Kill is just getting started. The second level that Kill a Kill succeeds on is how it tells a gripping action shonen type story. And remember, I love action shonen shows. Ryoko is trying to get revenge for her father's murder, get special powers to fight other people's special powers, and then there's lots of action, lots of twists, and even the power of friendship leading up to her uncovering the truth. And then she saves those she loves with the power of friendship. Even without the absurdity of the show, it has all the elements of a story I would love. And then the third and final aspect where Kill a Kill succeeds is the thematic message of the show. There is a ton of commentary in here about society and greed and family and sexuality and fate. Because of the absurd nature of Kill a Kill, it is able to be very expressive about its themes without feeling like it's coming across too strong. These three layers are woven together to make Kill a Kill one of the best anime I've ever seen, or at least one of my personal favorites if we're talking objective versus subjective here for whatever reason. I mean, it's my review, my opinion. Isn't that obvious? Maybe not, whatever. So now that I went over the show broadly, let's get into some of the details. So starting with the overall story, this is normally where I would summarize the show for you, but instead I am lazy and will let the show tell its story for you. Ryuko Matoi is searching for her father's killer, someone with a half pair of scissors. She arrives at Honoji Academy and meets Satsuki Kiryui, the student council president. Satsuki plans to conquer all the schools in Japan using Goku uniforms, clothing that contains life fibers and that can unleash the human body's special abilities. But when Ryuko met me, Kamui Senkets, she gained the power to fight Satsuki in her vile clubs like boxing, tennis, disciplinary trap development, gardening, Rakugo, 100 poets, knife throwing, Nanjing Lily, etc, etc. Yeah, that was from the recap episode. Best recap ever, by the way. The best part of the show is what happens once all the setup is complete. The first half or so of the show is all about setting up the characters, the world, giving us an idea of what normal is. And then it all falls down and is amazing. Here is where the characters are pushed to their limits, forced to face their inner demons, and understand what truly matters most. It seemed like every episode would have an incredible twist or just something to further draw me in. And the battles are some of the best here because of the sense of desperation the characters were feeling. They were up against such great odds, facing enemies that were so much stronger than they were. So they had to rely on strategy here. They could not just use brute force to win, and sometimes it was just a matter of how could they run away without dying. And because the show is so absurd, the strategies that they came up with were also absurd, which only added to the fun. While most shows, if a character pulled off a nonsensical strategy, it would hurt the show because it's stupid. In Kill a Kill's case, it helps the show because it is stupid. And this final arc, or whatever you call it, is probably my favorite series of episodes in all of anime, or if not, it comes really close to it. But after experiencing the greatness of this part, it kind of makes the earlier setup episodes less exceptional, or at least that's the opinion I had when I first watched Kill a Kill. Because when you know the overarching plot, a lot of the early episodes don't do much to advance it. I recently rewatched this with friends. Yes, Shambu, I am confused why Bill posted his pictures of rocks too, but that's not what I'm talking about right now. Granted, you can't hear me, so it doesn't matter what I say. Uh, yes. But the great 
latter episodes make the early ones feel less exceptional, or at least that is how I saw it at first. Because when you know the overarching plot, a lot of the early episodes don't do anything to advance it. And Astro, that is a terrible pun. After a recent rewatch with friends, though, I see that these early episodes were the key to the show's success. Ryuko fighting the various club presidents established a sense of normalcy for the show, which made breaking this normalcy to have a more powerful effect. And even if the plot may not have been driven forward, we still constantly learn more about the world or the characters and their relationships. Even episode 4, which could easily be described as filler, served a purpose as being a release of tension after episode 3. And episode 4 was just so much fun that I didn't care if it didn't add anything to, new to the show. I don't think it would have worked well if you went straight from episode 3 to 5. So, 4 being filler actually worked well. I also liked how we slowly learn about the world. Ryoko wants answers, but only slowly gets them. And it's quite cool to finally understand how everything ties together and all the different character motivations and how they just come together like a grand tapestry. Her journey for revenge was great too. She is the type of character that is very driven, will tear down any wall in her way to get what she wants, and she has little patience for annoyances or those who get in her way. She's a very active protagonist, which makes her easy to root for. And she also gets a lot of development too through the show as she starts to shed her way of being a loner and accepting who she is and the love of those around her. She really is an amazing protagonist and is a primary example of how a good female protagonist should work. Or heck, a primary example of how any good protagonist could work. And you know what? She is only the third greatest character of the show. Then there is Mako. Ryoko's friend through everything the show throws at her and Mako will stick with Ryoko no matter what, whether Ryoko wants her there or not. Mako is completely insane. She gives speeches that make no sense but fit the situation perfectly. Sometimes you need a friend who refuses to listen to reason and that's what Mako is because the traffic lights in her world are always yellow. That's actually a quote from the show. Plus Mako gets a few moments to really shine but I don't want to spoil those, though they are awesome. Mako is the perfect embodiment of what Kill a Kill is. See a single scene with Mako and I think you'll understand the show. And then the last of the three main characters, Satsuki, the student council president and one of the main antagonists of the show. Early on, Satsuki hints that she definitely knows something about Ryoko's father's murder, but won't say what it is. So Ryoko wants to beat Satsuki up to get answers, but despite her strength, Satsuki is not someone she can beat. The reason I love Satsuki so much is how powerful her will is. She is someone who will do whatever it takes to accomplish her goal, and I don't mean that she's just stubborn. Other characters are stubborn. Satsuki is something else. She is very calculating and choosing to consider her options instead of just recklessly rushing into a situation. It is when she is backed into a corner that we see how great she really is. She also grows quite a lot through the show, especially as she is forced to face her failures. She even has this whole like powerful presence around her, and not just a shining light, but also how everything she says just has this weight to it. The supporting cast is also great. Every character has a strong personality that lets them stand out, and they're really able to build off each other, like the banter between the Elite Four, or just Mako and Gamagori, complete polar opposites, but their dynamic is just so great. That is probably the weirdest relationship in the show, but seeing the way they grow to care about each other despite being on opposite sides of this conflict is just so great. I ship it. Then you also have Mako's family, or the fact that nudist beach is a thing. Really, my only complaint with the side characters is they don't like get that many times to shine on their own. The Elite Four get some good ones as a group, but most of them don't get that many on their own. But still, when they're this fun, they are just amazing to watch and I love them all. And speaking of fun, let's talk about the dub. Kill a Kill has one of the best dubs in all of anime, and this is after I saw the subtitled version of it first. Every voice actor is on point here, able to capture the personality of the character perfectly, from the tough and stubborn Ryoko, to the hyperactive Mako, to the larger than life Gamagori. The only character I didn't think fit perfectly, at least at first, was Satsuki because she did not have the same strength I was expecting, though after giving it more of a chance, I think that it actually works better this way. Satsuki does not need a loud and overpowering voice, but instead a more quiet strength fits her. 
Then the rest of the supporting cast were just great, and while I will not get into all of them, I do have to mention Benjamin Diskin's performance as Takarada. I'll be playing the clip. What's up, you Honoji Academy dipshits? I'm Kaneo Takarada, student council president of Naniwa Kimon Age! Y'all might think you the man up in Kobe and Kyoto, but this is Osaka G. So unless you want my foot up your ass, get to step it. Don't need to when I got the flapping gums of all the grannies in Osaka on my side. You might have put the net on lockdown, but those chicks can spread a rumor faster than a pimp can slap a hoe, yo. Check it. You in my house now, homie. The O to the Saka's a merchant town. And might as well make this place go round. The G with the most coin wins up in here. You hear that, his accent is just perfect and fits the character so well, it turns a relatively unimportant character into one that I just love seeing on screen. More than that though, the dialogue just flows so well for his personality, really fitting his character. They did not just translate the dialogue, but they took the lines and made them how they should sound in English. And you can't get that from a pure translation, and this is how dubbing should be. It wasn't just for Takarada they did this either, but, but all the dialogue felt it was made with the English-speaking audience in mind. Or at least an English-speaking audience that loved absurd shows. It just flowed so well. So yes, highly recommend the dub for this one. And then the soundtrack. Pure amazing. I'll even go so far as to say this is my favorite soundtrack in all of anime. The soundtrack builds up so much hype, especially the different versions of like Before My Body Is Dry, or as you may know it, the Don't Lose Your Way song. The show trains you to expect the epic chorus when the softer parts start playing in the background, so when you hear that during the action, it just builds up the hype. The character themes also have such a great flavor to them, really capturing who these characters are. And more than just working as a soundtrack, it's also music that I can listen to on my own. And not just for like one or two songs, but like half a dozen, if not more. Like yeah, Before My Body Is Dry, but also Bloom and Crown, Light Your Heart Up, Till I Die, Sanbika, or one that I recently noticed, Suck Your Blood. Each of these songs is so different, but it's great and helps to tell a story that is Kill a Kill. There's also the animation, which really is just spectacular. Kill a Kill has such a style to it, and there isn't a show out there that has the same sort of style. It feels kind of retro where the animation isn't really the smoothest, but everything here is done with a purpose. You have like minimal animation or just going against conventional rules of animation that all adds to the presentation. So I really believe that Kill a Kill is one of the best directed shows out there and that is what makes the show so much fun. Well, Actually, that's not true. Everything I talked about comes together to make the show fun. You have the action shown in type plot taken to the absurd, larger than life characters, brilliant animation and directing, and a soundtrack that just makes me feel all the things that it wants me to feel. But Kill a Kill is more than just dumb fun. It is very aware of anime storytelling and what the viewer would come to expect. There are a couple times where the show is able to set things up in a way that gives the viewer exactly what they want, only they don't know they want it until it happens. Then there are times where it leans into the parody-like structure to get away with cliches because it is self-aware, like Ryoko's power-up. Sure, you could say that they came out of nowhere, and they kind of did, and that they didn't make much sense, but they added to the fun, in a similar way with the explanation of the world. It is stupid, but Kill a Kill is stupid. So, a stupid explanation is good. But then there are times where it subverts these fun expectations with big twists and all the character struggles that really make the show so great. Between the fun and the type of story that I just always love seeing, there are plenty of things for me to praise Kill a Kill. But this show isn't content to just be a story told at the surface level, but instead it has a lot of deeper themes and messages. It has a lot of social commentary. And the thing I like about it is how it's not subtle. You don't have to really dig deep to figure it out. And typically when a show is like this, yelling its themes as loud as it can, that just comes across as overbearing. But Kill a Kill is all about yelling, so it only makes sense that it would yell its themes too. I love the ideas here about embracing contradictions, the love of family, and just finding your way in life. There are also cautions about those who love money or power too much, and how arrogance can cloud even the best intentions, or even how a desire for a normal life can destroy so much. And then we have to talk about the fan service too. You've seen it on screen plenty, so I figure I should address it at some point. Or at least, it, the lack of fan service. Because 
I don't think this is even a fan service show, at least not under the common definition. Yes, the characters do show quite a bit of skin. You see the entire cast naked at one point or another, and there's so much more going on, so much to the story that the fact that the characters are naked don't even really matter. There is a scene in episode 3 where Sasuke basically yells at Ryoko, telling her, why are you so worried with how you look? And in a way that also speaks to the viewer, saying, yes, these characters look ridiculous and they're showing so much skin. But that's not the point of the show. And as you watch more, there's so much to the story that the fact that the characters are nearly naked just doesn't really matter. There's a scene that illustrated this perfectly, and that was near the end of episode 22. And if you are someone who did not know Kill a Kill, and I showed you this scene, it would just look like pure fan service without meaning. But it was one of the most joyful scenes in the entire anime because of what it represented. Yes, boobs were flying everywhere, but because we're so used to seeing the characters this way, the nudity didn't mean anything. But instead, the show could fully focus on the emotional release of the scene. It's like Kill a Kill is making fun of how fan service is normally used by going even further than most, but also desensitizing the viewer to it so that it never gets in the way of the story. And no review of Kill a Kill would be complete without how Kill a Kill completed, and that was the OVA. There is a trend in anime where shows are left unfinished, and then we never get more. Kill a Kill is not like that. It had the perfect conclusion after episode 24. But then the OVA came around and changed that, throwing in a new last met conflict. But the OVA also wrapped this up quickly while adding in a lot of character development and giving a true catharsis to this journey for all the characters. And that just gave Kill a Kill an even more satisfying ending. And that gave Kill a Kill not one satisfying ending, but two. And I also loved the themes addressed in the OVA all about moving on from the past, and it was a great graduation episode. My favorite graduation episode in all of anime. So yes, Kill a Kill is amazing. Therefore, it gets a score of a 10 out of 10 and my highest rating a masterpiece. Go watch this if you have not done so already, and if you enjoyed half as much as I did, you'll be in for a very fun time.